thanks so much to Aura and the panel for really a, a discussion that I think um, captured many of the themes that we've spoken about during the last uh, two and a half days. Uh, bringing together uh, fundamental mechanisms, uh, discovery, development, and, and implementation, uh, but finding ways to, to really have a shared data reality to actually do all of that. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, um, we do seem to all be projecting towards next year's forum, uh, where how we actually put the data together is really going to be one of the core themes. Uh, and artificial intelligence, obviously, is, is something that is certainly a, a major driver in that space. Um, one or two housekeeping issues. So uh, there will be a link uh, to a survey that will uh, go out to all of the registries, uh, registrants, rather, uh, in the next 24 hours. So please try and fill that in and allow us to uh, model the things uh, that, are, that are best for next year's forum. Uh, and then, really, just uh, we're going to move to introduce this uh, next segment, which is the Disruptive Dozen, uh, the final section of the uh, World uh, Medical Innovation Forum. Tony. Thanks, Callum. So, uh, obviously, the central theme of this entire symposium has been innovation. And so, for the last uh, closing uh, feature, what we're going to do is, is focus on what we've been calling the disruptive dozen. And the idea here was to identify 12 novel concepts, advances, uh, technologies that we anticipate will really transform cardiovascular medicine over the coming decade. And so there was uh, quite a process associated with this. So nominations were taken throughout the community. Of those, uh, 50 were honed in on and then a uh, a committee of experts in all of these areas convened to review these and, and, and voted on which they thought were most likely to uh, really be transformative and disruptive in that sense. Um, I think a, a, a central a participant in this entire process throughout who really helped crystallize this was Gerald Cousins, who's a science writer who's really been with the Innovation Forum from the beginning. Um, he really brought together the ideas, uh, crystallized them by, by writing them down so that they could be reviewed and, and, and considered. So I, I do want to thank all of the committee members, and in particular Gerald, who's sitting here in the front row, for his part in that. So please join me in giving him a hand. Of a round of applause, uh, recognizing that predictions are hazardous, especially about the future. Um, I think it'll be interesting to see, and hopefully there's some process, Chris, for looking back a decade from now and considering you know, how we did. Um, but uh, the procedure for the remaining uh, segment of the symposium is we're going to have a brief uh, video vignette that, that explains each of the concepts and ideas. The representative of that idea will, will be here. You can you see the 12 seats uh, out here. And then either Callum or I will ask one or, or two questions. They'll have two minutes to answer those uh, questions. Um, and then we'll move on to the next, and we'll, uh, in, in the, following the lead of David Letterman, start with number 12 and march backwards to number one. Uh, so uh, with that, um, if we could have the, f the first or the 12th uh, disruptive idea uh, video, uh, we'll start with that one. So I should have said we're welcoming the disruptive dozen to the stage, and then we'll, they'll start with the video. The questions would have fallen flat if we just used the empty chairs. So that's... <laughs> All right, so now if we could have the video for D the number 12, that would be great. Number 12, aging and heart disease, can we reverse the process? Although advanced age is strongly linked with the incidence of heart disease, it has long been perceived as a non-modifiable risk factor, one that we just accept in the natural evolution of life. 
Exciting research into the biology of aging, however, is beginning to suggest otherwise. Today, scientists are not only identifying key molecular mechanisms that drive aging, but are also using innovative approaches to delve into some of the most fundamental, yet unanswered questions about it. For example, how do seemingly simple lifestyle interventions, such as exercise and diet, improve health as we age? Groundbreaking discoveries are now pushing the boundaries of aging and leading to the development and testing of novel therapies that will hopefully halt or perhaps even reverse the human aging process in the heart and the vasculature. Boston researchers are studying proteins called Growth Differentiation Factors 8 and 11, or GDF 8 and 11. The scientists have already reported that GDF 11 has the potential to undo much of the cellular damage in the heart triggered by aging, but in mice, not humans. While an anti-aging drug to treat heart disease may have once seemed like science fiction, examples like this and others suggest that it may very well be possible in humans in the near future. Groundbreaking discoveries that slow or reverse aging phenotypes in animal models, from improving protein homeostasis to diminishing oxidative stress to killing senescent cells, continue to generate excitement about someday targeting the aging process for therapies for chronic age-related medical conditions. So representing this topic is Jason Rowe. Jason, what, what are some of the exciting anti-aging strategies that we can potentially move to the clinic for cardiovascular disease in the, in the future? Um, first of all, Callum, um, thanks for just having me up here. I'm just um, incredibly humbled to be amongst this amazing cast up here. Um, I think part of the reason why I was asked to talk about aging is, um, as you can see, I've circumvented puberty somehow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but. Ultimately, um, I just really want to emphasize that it's really an exciting time in cardiovascular aging research right now. And it's a large part because of what the science is showing us. I mean, whether it's targeted senolytic therapies that can reverse atherosclerosis, or whether it's autophagy inducers like spermidine that can reverse the, the, the relaxation properties of the aged heart. I think what we're starting to realize now is that aging is not necessarily this passive process of time that we have no control over. Um, and I think what, what becomes really promising is that we're actually thinking about aging in a completely different perspective now. It's, it's, this, it's, this, it's this fundamental process that we have the ability to change. And if we can change it, then we can actually change the, the field that we're looking at, essentially, in a way. What I'm, what I'm trying to get at is if we fundamentally think about aging as a process that actually derives some of the heart disease that we try to treat, then it opens up this incredibly rich new area for therapeutic development that we've actually never tapped into before. What, what are some of the obstacles that have stopped us tapping into this? I think it, it, it's, it's difficult, you know, because so what we're trying to do here is essentially outsmart nature. And that's not an easy task to do, if you think about it in the grand scheme of things. And so I think when we, when we, when we try to identify pathways that are altered by aging, we really need to understand what is compensatory and what has actually become maladaptive as we've become older. And I think when we start to recognize the dif differences between t those, those two concepts, we're actually much closer to actually taking this to humans. So I, I know this seems like a high bar, but I do want to emphasize that Jason is 75 years old, so <laughs> I think it's attainable. Jason, thank you. Let's go to number 11. Number 11, nanotechnologies for cardiac diagnosis and treatment. Over the next decade, nanotechnology, the science of engineering and controlling matter at the molecular scale, to create devices with novel chemical, physical, and or biological properties, has the potential to change how atherosclerosis and other heart diseases are treated. A single nanoparticle is 100 times smaller than a red blood cell. Recently, a group of Boston researchers used targeted nanoparticle technology to reduce atherosclerosis in an animal model in the first study of its kind. The researchers were able to make the nanoparticles in the study latch onto arterial plaque, releasing a drug that quelled inflammation damage. After five weeks of nanomedicine, the atherosclerosis was significantly repaired, making it less likely for the plaques to block the blood vessels. In another recent study, 
Researchers in Ann Arbor, Michigan, use nanoparticles on the hearts of sheep to target and help destroy cells that cause cardiac arrhythmias. The nanoparticles were small enough to penetrate tiny pores inside heart capillaries, but large enough to carry light-sensitive chemicals that cause it to be absorbed by cardiac myocytes. Low-level red light was then delivered to the area, destroying only the cells that had absorbed the nanoparticles, while leaving other heart cells unharmed. Challenges remain, but companies are already creating nanotechnologies that are in various stages of development to help treat, repair, and possibly even prevent heart attacks and other heart-related ailments. So representing this uh, concept and technology is Natalie Artsy. And uh, Natalie, this is a fascinating area. If, if, you, if money were not a limit, and hopefully members of this audience can make that so, um, what would you see as the most exciting opportunities for using this nanotechnology to impact cardiovascular disease? Thank you very much for inviting me. Very happy to be here. I think the most exciting element of nanotechnology is that it is an enabling technology. And if, if in fact, we are to exploit the plethora of uh, new biomarkers and use them as a target therapeutics, whether we use gene therapy, editing technologies, small molecules, or drug delivery, we need a delivery vehicle that will carry the cargo, the payload to the target site. And as we've heard, we can use it now to uh, enhance, you can use nanoparticles to enhance their accumulation at the target site and even be selective. What we can do with that is actually design a chip that we can implant in patients that can treat them and diagnose based on need. So if we implant this chip that can sample biomarkers in blood and in interstitial fluid simultaneously, we could then get a signal and a, a, that would trigger a release of therapeutics, for example. We can pair it with those tiny nanoparticles that can uh, circulate in the blood, uh, interact with different molecules, go back and home to our chip, provide a signal, and then it will trigger a specific therapy. If we can imagine that, that would be amazing. And are there any limits to how specifically you can target these nanoparticles? Yeah, I think there's a, a, a huge body of research that shows that we can uh, improve accumulation, but uh, at times uh, we can not completely control clearance mechanisms. So some of the particles will accumulate at other target organs, but we are improving in that and we can actually make those particles triggered, which means that even if they carry a payload and gets to a different organ, they're not going to release the drug unless they get a specific signal, a specific stimuli uh, that is representative of a disease or a specific cell type. It's not going to release the payload, and, and that's why we can minimize those side effects. Great. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, number 10, breaking the code, diagnostic and therapeutic potential of RNA. Number 10, breaking the code, diagnostic and therapeutic potential of RNA. Ribonucleic acid, or RNA, is one of the three major biological macromolecules that are, along with DNA and proteins, essential for all known forms of life. Recently, types of RNA called microRNAs, miRNA, and long non-coding RNAs, link RNAs, have been found to play important roles in gene regulation capturing international scientific attention for their potential as markers of heart health, as well as possible treatments for cardiovascular disease. A Boston-based research team is now working to identify miRNA molecules that can serve as biomarkers to help predict outcomes in patients with heart disease. By using RNA sequencing technology, the researchers have identified characteristics in extracellular RNAs in plasma that might enable them to predict patient outcomes following a heart attack. A 2016 study by German researchers reported that link RNA could serve as a drug target for cardiac hypertrophy. By treating mice with an inhibitor that targeted a link RNA named CHAST, they prevented and treated cardiac hypertrophy while simultaneously improving heart function. Understanding the important role RNA now plays, novel heart diagnostics and innovative drug therapies will be available within the next decade that can help transform the treatment of cardiac disease. Representing this burgeoning area is Soumya Das. Uh, Soumya, where do you think in the diagnostic space uh, extracellular RNAs are going to first be deployed as biomarkers in cardiovascular disease? 
Uh, thanks, Callum. <clears throat> I'm also incredibly excited to be here to represent this uh, emerging field. Um, and so as Callum alluded to, um, what we've found out in the last uh, decade or so is that some of these non-coding RNAs are actually present in the plasma, um, often within uh, vesicles, uh, and are incredibly stable over years, um, making it feasible to measure them in archival samples. And uh, really over the last two or three years, one of the emerging um, ideas is that these um, RNAs in plasma are actually functional biomarkers, meaning they're implicated in cellular processes uh, that are important in cardiovascular diseases. So I think uh, unlike sort of bystander proteins like troponin that we've heard about, um, these RNAs uh, playing a functional role in disease pathogenesis probably represent a much more robust type of prognostic biomarker signature and I think uh, uh, focusing on these and characterizing them in large cohorts over the next decade will yield uh, really important signatures that might predict things like cardiac remodeling or sudden cardiac death or heart failure. And Somya, what do you think on the other side are the obstacles to getting RNA delivery tuned for therapeutic uses? Yeah, so I think uh, we've heard a little bit about this in this whole uh, symposia yesterday. Uh, we learned that RNA therapeutics are, are making a big headway. Uh, companies like Alnylam uh, and uh, um, uh, ISIS, uh, which is now called, uh, for obvious reasons, uh, <laughs> Ionis. <laughs> um, but Natalie referred to uh, you know, the difficulty in uh, targeting specific cell types, and that remains an issue. Um, we can target certain organs like the liver, skeletal muscle, and retina, as we heard about yesterday. But I think going forward, as we... Uh, uh, use nanoparticles and other type of targeted um, uh, strategies, we'll be able to get them into cardiac cells. Great. Let's go to number nine. Number nine, expanding the pool of organs for transplant. While heart transplantation continues to be the gold standard for treating end-stage heart failure, there are simply not enough donor hearts available for Americans on the transplant wait list. Doctors and scientists are now developing innovative alternatives. The role of mechanical circulatory support devices in advanced heart replacement therapy is increasing steadily, with some thinking that these devices could have the potential to overcome heart transplant in the next decade. Doctors recently implanted the first intravascular ventricular assist system to assist and support a patient awaiting a heart transplant. This novel IVAC system doesn't require open heart surgery. Furthermore, it reduces pain and dramatically shortens rehabilitation. Aiming to repair the heart rather than replace it, a group of Boston-based scientists have successfully grown human heart tissue by using messenger RNA to revert skin cells to stem cells that could then be stimulated to grow into cardiac muscle tissue. When used to regenerate tissue in hearts damaged by heart attack or heart failure, this therapy could eliminate the need for heart transplant altogether. Other Boston researchers are addressing the heart shortage by using CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing to create an endless supply of safe and dependable pig hearts that would be suitable for use in humans. Within a year, they expect to be transplanting the porcine organs into primates. Thank you. So representing this uh, technology or series of technologies is Jordan Madsen, who's a cardiac surgeon and the head of the MGH uh, Transplant Center. Um, Jordan has requested that no one report him to the parallel thoracic surgery meeting going on next door, <laughs> and we appreciate his being here. Jordan, so, so we've heard about a, a number of different technological approaches to cardiac replacement therapies. How do you see these rolling out? Which do you think will be first and, and why? Thanks, Tony. I, um I'd like to register a complaint first. These are actually three disruptive technologies, and I think <laughs> I deserved a higher number. <laughs> it's but, the dis uh, disruptive 15 didn't yeah. somehow <laughs> ring, though. So it's a good question, and, and the answer has evolved over time. I would say five to 10 years ago, I would have gone with um, mechanical support. Uh, we were miniaturizing. We were developing axial flow centrifugal pumps that were technologically more uh, uh, safe and improved. Um, more recently, I probably would have answered the bioengineering, uh, whole organs or patches. Uh, but on May 3rd, 2017, I'd have to go with uh, the pig um, for two reasons. One, uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 system 
has a, a, a seemingly limitless potential to, to, in essence, humanize the pig further, which makes it more compatible for transplantation. And even more compelling is that I have actually seen a pig heart uh, in a, a baboon beating vigorously two years after implantation in a very healthy animal. It was in a heterotopic position, but I'm convinced that if it had been in an orthotopic position, it would have uh, preserved life. So that's, wow. uh, that's where I'm going. That's where I'm placing my bet. Well, that's very exciting. So we've already heard from representatives from two different CRISPR companies here who were also very excited about the technology. What do you see as the challenges in, in, in implementing that? So um, the challenge in implementing the uh, xenotransplantation right now is uh, really the complement and the coagulation system. The good news is that we've actually battled the immune system and won, which is that in itself is quite amazing. But now uh, the complement and coagulation systems have raised their, their heads uh, in the uh, form of a thrombotic microangiopathy that seems to be the, the, the major uh, barrier. Um, and I think that some of the technology in terms of gene editing will allow us to conquer that. I would have said uh, a year ago that porcine and uh, endogenous retroviruses, something that everybody seems to be concerned about, would be on the list. But again, with the gene editing technology, I think that's going to be a moot point going forward. Great. Well, so I think, <clears throat> I think Jordan, you actually told me that Norman Shumway, the legendary transplant cardiac surgeon, uh, once said that xenotransplantation is the future of cardiac transplantation and always will be. So you may be disproving that, and that would be tremendously exciting and a huge benefit to our patients. Um, could we have number eight, please? Number eight, finding cancer therapies without cardiotoxicity. Thanks to powerful new oncology therapies, many people are surviving cancers that were once believed to be fatal. Unfortunately, the off-target effects of these cancer therapies can have deadly repercussions, such as clotting issues, heart failure, cardiac arrhythmia, heart attack, severe hypertension, QT prolongation, or other serious illnesses. The primary goal of cancer treatment is to eradicate and prevent the reoccurrence of cancer, thereby prolonging life. Approximately 14 million cancer survivors in the United States alive today owe their lives in part to chemotherapy and radiation treatments. Nonetheless, cancer survival gains have revealed an unintended consequence of therapy, an increased incidence of cardiotoxicity. In adult patients, cardiotoxicity is drug dependent and depending on the type of cardiac condition, incidence can be as high as 50%. Biomarkers may represent one of the most cost-effective and minimally invasive means for diagnosing and monitoring cardiac injury following cancer therapy. Palo Alto-based researchers are now testing stem cell-derived heart cells from volunteers to develop a cardiac safety index that may be used to determine how toxic tyrosine kinase inhibitors are to the human heart. In the coming years, this new index may not only help the pharmaceutical industry identify drugs that cause heart-related side effects during the drug development process, but it will also help the Food and Drug Administration during the review and approval process. Representing this uh, area, this conceptual framework, is Dr. Andrew Noria, who is the Director of Cardio-Oncology at Brigham and Women's. Andrew, um, Cardiac toxicity has been around for a long time with many chemotherapeutic agents. What is the reason that we're now building uh, structured cardio-oncology programs? So I think there are about four reasons. One, as the video showed, cancer survivors are living much longer. And as they live longer, they live long enough to have the cardiovascular side effects of their prior chemotherapy. And many of them are developing recurrent cancer, so they're needing additional chemotherapies. And really, we need to come up with ways to try and minimize the cumulative cardiotoxicity of all of these treatments. Secondly, there's been an explosion in new cancer therapies, and a lot of them target signaling pathways that are not unique to the cancer cells, but often have cardiac side effects as well. And therefore, keeping up with this burgeoning field and knowing how to, one, monitor for cardiac toxicities, and two, treat and prevent them is becoming an increasing field. And I think lastly and most importantly, knowing the mechanisms or the biology by which these drugs are causing cardiac toxicity 
can actually lead to an avenue for discovering new cardiac therapeutics. Andrew, do you think we're going to see uh, companion uh, rescue agents for some of these uh, oncology <coughs> drugs? So combining uh, a cardiac drug with a chemotherapeutic agent? So I think that would be the dream in the future. Unfortunately, right now, there's only one such drug available, dexrosoxane, which is an iron chelator, and that seems like a very basic mechanism by which to target these things. But using a lot of the technologies that have been mentioned by people prior to me, such as nanotechnologies to deliver the, cardi uh, the cancer drugs directly to the tumor and not to the heart, using RNAs to silence the effects in other organs, these are other technologies that can be used in combination with cancer therapeutics to try and minimize the cardiac toxicity. Andrew, thank you. Let's go to number seven, please. Number seven, less is more, minimalist mitral valve repair. The mitral valve is a one-way dual flap valve that conducts blood flow through the left side of the heart. When open, the mitral valve permits oxygenated blood from the lungs to fill the heart's main pumping chamber, the left ventricle. Once this ventricle squeezes to deliver blood throughout the body, the mitral valve closes to prevent blood from flowing back toward the lungs. Severe mitral valve regurgitation, or MR, occurs when the mitral valve permits blood from the left ventricle to leak back towards the lungs. Depending on the severity of the leakage, MR can lead to progressive lung congestion and heart failure. In the United States, MR affects nearly 1 in 10 people age 75 and older. The most definitive treatment involves surgical repair of the valve or replacement with a prosthetic valve. Open heart mitral valve surgery and the minimally invasive approach done with an incision in the front or side of the chest are the standard treatments, but many people are not healthy enough to undergo them. Percutaneous valve placement, the replacement or repair of the mitral valve through the blood vessels, is the least traumatic of all surgeries. A variety of experimental repair techniques are now being tested for transcatheter mitral valve replacement, TMVR, including devices used on the mitral leaflets, the implantation of neocords, and the remodeling of the mitral annulus. With ongoing technological advancements in the field, it is expected that within the next decade, TMVR will become a valuable, minimally invasive alternative to mitral valve procedures for patients with severe MR and a high surgical risk. Great. So representing this uh, concept and technology is Prem Shekhar from Brigham and Women's Hospital. Prem, uh, we've heard in this conference uh, a, a lot about transcatheter aortic valve replacement and how that has really blossomed into an enormous industry um, that's answering uh, an unmet clinical need. And we've also heard about the challenges of transcatheter mitral valve procedures. Why do you think the mitral procedures, whether transcatheter or with surgical repair that's minimally invasive, will really be even more disruptive than the aortic procedures? <laughs> so Tony and uh, Callum, uh, thank you for inviting a simple barber surgeon <laughs> to sit amongst brilliant minds. I'm very grateful. Um, so transcatheter aortic valve replacement um, was developed for uh, calcific aortic stenosis. Um, uh, this, you know, the aortic valve is calcified very easily seen on, um, on, the, on, on imaging and you know, sort of X marks the spot, you know, just like we do it in surgery, take it out, put a new one in, or in transcatheter valve, just deploy a valve. Um, the same will probably come to be applied for calcific mitral valve disease, but the, the challenging piece is going to be uh, the large proportion of patients that have myxomatous mitral valve disease. And these are not seen by, uh, you, know, uh, cat, cat, you know, cat lab imaging. They are usually better seen on uh, echocardiographic imaging. And every surgeon knows that every single mitral valve is different. The treatment for uh, myxomatous mitral valve disease is extremely individualized. And trying to reproduce this using either transcatheter uh, technique uh, or a direct surgical technique without the use of cardioplomy bypass through a very small incision uh, in a durable fashion is what is, going to be, uh, what is going to be disruptive. I mean, there are technologies out there right now that are uh, identifying 
certain concepts, but, uh, but empl employing technologies that, that actually t uh, involve the entire spectrum of surgical repair techniques is what, what's, it's, is what's going to make the difference. Thanks, Prem. And, and what do you see as the cautionary notes to keep in mind as we move down this path? Yeah, thank you for asking me that question. Um, you know, it, as we walk down this path of innovation and discovery and uh, new technology and, uh, and, its, uh, and our eagerness to adopt new gleaming technology, one, we have to sort of stop to, uh, uh, to take a pause to um, see how this disruptive technology today could be a problem tomorrow. Uh, so that is something that we should have the foresight to do uh, as well. Uh, surgeons have walked down this path before where, you know, maybe 15 years ago, we employed technologies that we thought were nice and bright and shiny, and then 15 years later discovered that they were not as bright and shiny anymore. So every time we walk down this path, I think the cautionary tale, stop, wonder, if this is the right thing to do at this time for a person who will be maybe 75 in 15 years, and that may be a bad idea mm. at that time. Great. Thanks, Prem. If we could have number six, please. Number six, understanding why exercise works for just about everything. Exercise is a natural medicine available to all. Cardiac research has proven over the years that moderate exercise improves the circulation and metabolism, which reduces the chance of heart attack. Regular exercise also lowers both heart rate and blood pressure, improves the cholesterol profile, and helps to prevent the development of life-threatening plaque within the heart's arteries. Exercising several times a week can be a big step toward improving cardiovascular endurance, muscular strength, muscular endurance, and flexibility the four basic elements of physical fitness. While each of these elements is essential to overall health, cardiovascular endurance, the ability of the heart, lungs, and circulatory system to do their job is the most important. Although fitness has been shown to be among the most potent predictors of future cardiovascular disease, it is one of the only major risk factors that is not routinely assessed by physicians. Boston researchers are now investigating if specific tests of exercise capacity and the presence or absence of dozens of molecules in the bloodstream, called metabolites, can be used to identify patients who benefit from early treatment to prevent cardiovascular disease. Based on this research, it's expected that within a few years, simple exercise testing equipment will be used in doctor's offices to routinely assess heart health with a seven-minute test. Representing exercise in all its forms is Greg Lewis. Greg's not only a world-class athlete, but he also directs uh, one of the leading investigative programs in exercise. Greg, uh, how are you using um, sophisticated modern exercise um, physiology in preclinical and clinical studies? Uh, thank you, uh, Callum. It's really an honor to be here. Uh, just modify that slightly as uh, to say former uh, athlete as opposed to present, <laughs> not necessarily practicing what I preach. Uh, so exercise has clearly uh, been established to be a risk factor over many years. It's been recognized uh, for its salutary health benefits. I think, Callum, what's, what, what's really uh, changing and what's innovative is how we're making measurements uh, during the state of exercise I think the vast majority of measurements that we make in patients with cardiovascular and other diseases are in the resting state. Uh, and now we can move towards deep phenotyping under the, the state of exercise. And that can include precise hemodynamic measurements uh, being made during exercise, measuring how circulating metabolites change in response to exercise. We heard from Sami about microRNA, uh, a 10 minute bout of exercise will markedly modulate circulating levels of certain microRNAs. And so a lot of the innovation comes from a recognition of what we can easily measure during exercise. The modern uh, metabolic carts permit us to make breath-by-breath -breath measurements of gas exchange variables that give us uh, additional information about uh, patient prognosis uh, and help us to separate 
patients on the basis of their unique uh, physiologic responses to exercise. What, what are we learning from these studies? What are some early insights? Yeah, so uh, some of the insights relate to uh, how things beyond just uh, traditional metrics such as an electrocardiogram or blood pressure or heart rate responses to exercise, we can now measure hundreds of variables. And so for example, certain circulating small molecules uh, during a 10 minute bout of exercise will change in a markedly different manner in a patient that has preserved relative to impaired cardiorespiratory fitness. So we find that across individuals, there's differences in substrate utilization for that same 10 minute bout of exercise. There's difference in how pro-inflammatory signals are regulated in response to exercise. So ultimately, can we want to create a, an exercise unique snapshot for an individual that can then be used to help direct their therapy and their care. Since we know that exercise can predict the future development of a heart attack, for example, we know that exercise hypertension will predict future development of hypertension. We want to uh, harness modern technologies and tools that can be easily applied to a simple exercise test uh, to predict the future of cardiometabolic diseases. Greg, thanks. Uh, let's move to number five, please. Number five, power play, the future of implantable cardiac devices. Electronic device therapy, which includes implantable cardiac pacemakers and cardioverter defibrillators, is the gold standard in the management of cardiac arrhythmias and a variety of other heart ailments. However, the significant drawbacks associated with electronic device therapy, complications from limited battery life, and infections from compromises in the leads that connect the device to the heart are significant, impact patients' autonomy, quality of life, and in many cases, survival. Advances made in the field of optogenetics may provide a workable, light-based antiarrhythmic solution within the next 10 years. Optogenetics is a technique in which genes for light-sensitive pro proteins are introduced into specific types of cells in order to monitor and control their activity precisely by using light signals. Scientists anticipate being able to use optogenetics to restore healthy heartbeats painlessly in many of the patients now requiring implantable devices. When it comes to pacemakers, a wireless device recently approved in Europe and now undergoing testing in Boston may offer hope to patients with heart failure who have failed conventional cardiac resynchronization therapy. This cardiac pacing system consists of a tiny electrode the size of a grain of rice that is attached to the inner wall of the left ventricle. With each heartbeat, it receives a synchronized ultrasound signal from a small battery-powered transmitter. Those sound waves are then converted to electrical energy, providing life-saving cardiac pacing to the two ventricles. When it comes to batteries, Within the next decade, it's expected that patients will be able to charge LVADs by placing a charger on their skin or by sitting next to a Wi-Fi power charger. For some, the battery will be implanted inside where it can be charged, freeing them forever from the battery cables that currently come out of the body. So representing this is Christine Albert. Christine is an electrophysiologist at the Brigham and also the head of a group interested in um, uh, preventive electrophysiology. Uh, so Christine, in fairness, we really heard about several technologies there as well from improved battery life to uh, optogenetics. There's quite a span. How do you see these technologies rolling out in what sort of time frame, and, and what do you see as the limitations? Sure. Um, first, thank you both for inviting me to talk on this very exciting topic. And um, the major issue, as was brought up in that <clears throat> conversation, was that the leads of these devices <clears throat> apologize, tend to be very um, uh, problematic. They cause infections, they can break, cause inappropriate shocks. So the field is moving towards trying to avoid leads. The, food is all, the field is also moving towards um, painless defibrillation, um, and there are actually adverse consequences to shocks as well, and patients who get more shocks tend to have a higher mortality. So these technologies are all aspects of that, the first being the um, light-sensitive um, defibrillation, and that is really far in the future. 
We have to try to get all of those light sensitive channels into all the heart muscle cells. We then have to get a device that will uh, deliver light energy to the heart at the time of an arrhythmia um, equilibrially so that the whole heart will defibrillate. Um, and so there's, there's some movement there, but I think it's very exciting and also exciting for potentially for pacing as well um, and maybe for resynchronization. The second technology um, is more now prime time where we're taking leadless devices. Um, some of them have been improved in the right ventricle. Uh, this is for the left ventricle. And the idea being that an ultrasound will help us to trigger the pacing. And so you can detect pacing from the right ventricle lead. So again, you've still got leads in the heart. You're not to the point where you're completely wireless, um, but it's getting there. And I think one of the challenges there will be putting something in the left side of the heart that, that's going to stay there. Um, and, you know, embolization, thrombogenicity, all of that is going to have to be um, worked out. And the battery charging, I think, is a great idea. I think it would be a great idea for every single implantable device. That's great. Thanks, Christine. And, and hopefully a uh, beneficial byproduct will be that our cell phones will last throughout a meeting like this as, <laughs> as well. So um, thanks very much. So if we could go now to number four. Number four, adopting the orphans of heart disease. Rare heart diseases, a group of serious but neglected disorders afflicting fewer than 200,000 individuals per disease in the United States, are one of the most scientifically complex health challenges of our time. Dozens of these uncommon cardiac ailments, including Brugada syndrome, Marfan syndrome, and arrhythmogenic right ventricle dysplasia, are called orphans because they occur so infrequently that it can be nearly impossible to interest researchers in finding effective treatments, let alone cures for them. In recent years, however, due to the convergence of regulatory, scientific, and societal forces, there has been a dramatic change in attention to rare diseases, heart ailments in particular. Congenital Long QT Syndrome, or LQTS, is an inherited heart disease that affects otherwise healthy individuals who carry an increased risk of sudden death due to uncontrollable arrhythmias. About 1 in 2,500 Americans are affected by LQTS, and 4,000 die annually. Boston-based researchers looking for an effective LQTS therapy have recently discovered a novel class of small molecule compounds that shortened the QT interval in multiple long QT models. The target of the new compounds is a potassium channel which is partially activated when bound by the compounds. Finding individual treatments for each of the many orphan heart diseases is a daunting task, but over the next decade, the increased investment of research efforts and monies will give sufferers of these rare ailments hope for effective therapies and even cures. So representing this uh, area of interest uh, is David Milan, who's an uh, electrophysiologist at uh, Mass General Hospital, but also directs a program that uses cell-based systems and zebrafish in, in primary drug discovery. David, how, how do you see this playing out? This is the balance between precision medicine, we're diagnosing things much more precisely, but if we really want to change the game, we have to be able to develop drugs at a completely different scale. Yeah, that's a great question, Callum. Uh, thank you for inviting me to participate in the panel today. The, um, I view these orphan diseases, I mean, personalized medicine we talked about yesterday in the panel, um, and that's, I think, when you think about diseases like hypertension and heart failure and atrial fibrillation, teasing those apart into their component subsets of diseases and finding therapies for those is a daunting task. I think dialing back and focusing on orphan diseases that are often genetically well-defined, for which you can develop predictive cellular or small animal models is in some ways an easier hurdle to, to go after. And I think that um, if you have those features in a disease such as we have in long QT syndrome, you have an opportunity to make a significant impact. So the, the, the things you're looking for are large unmet medical need, genetically well-defined syndrome, uh, predictive models that can allow you to, to develop drugs or discover new therapies. And then ideally, and this was touched on briefly in our, in our uh, personalized medicine uh, session yesterday, some of those therapies will be useful in larger segments of the population, not with just the orphan disease, but with uh, more common diseases as well. How do you see these early clinical trials going from an orphan setting to more broad-based use playing out? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So obviously the, the, the regulatory hurdles to, for development of an orphan uh, drug is, are, are relaxed and, and uh, rightfully so. Those, those trials are hard, hard to do and they're often difficult to enroll because of the rarity of the disease. Uh, once approved though, I think then you can start to uh, examine off-label use initially and then of course do larger trials to, uh, with the revenue from the orphan indication to expand into a larger population. Great, thanks David. Let's go to number three please. Number three, targeting inflammation in cardiovascular disease. When fatty, cholesterol-rich plaque accumulates within the arterial walls, the immune system perceives it to be a foreign invader and sends white blood cells to attack it, resulting in chronic low-grade arterial inflammation. It's now believed that heart attacks and stroke are linked to this smoldering inflammation with scientists hypothesizing that specifically targeting different inflammatory pathways may help to prevent and treat cardiovascular disease. A 2016 study by Boston-based researchers identified the mechanism behind the surge in cardiovascular inflammation that takes place following a heart attack. By uncovering the role of sympathetic nerve fibers that are activated within the arterial lining, the scientists were able to develop a potential strategy for suppressing the inflammation. Meanwhile, in an ongoing international study, scientists are testing an injectable anti-inflammatory drug that blocks the production of pro-inflammatory cytokine to see if it can reduce rates of recurrent heart attack, stroke, and death among heart attack patients. Will the careful lowering of chronic inflammation result in fewer cardiac events in the next decade? If the answer is yes, it will herald the dawn of a new era in which anti-inflammatory therapies will become the cornerstone of lowering the rate of vascular events. So representing this idea is uh, Matthias Nerendorf, who's a professor of systems biology um, and a cardiovascular researcher at uh, Mass Massachusetts General Hospital. Um, Matthias, as you know well, this concept has been around for a long time, and I would say sort of in parallel to the resurgence and now phenomenal success of harnessing the immunological system in cancer, you know, with a concept that had been there for a long time but now has finally come to fruition. Could you draw a parallel um, in, in harnessing anti-inflammatory interventions in the cardiovascular disease? So in 2017, what's going to be different now? And what would you think is the best strategy to target uh, inflammation in cardiovascular disease? So I think the uh, exciting new aspect is that we understand the heterogeneity of the immune system much better than we used to do. Take macrophages, for instance. We, we've learned that there are two different types of macrophages. Some are resident macrophages that live in organs and that are not uh, derived from the bone marrow. They pursue non-inflammatory functions such as regulation of metabolism or they participate in, in, in conduction in the heart. And then there are bone marrow derived macrophages that uh, are recruited by a monocytes from the circulation. And those are the cells that are inflammatory and destructive and actually uh, give rise to plaques, myocardial infarction, stroke, and heart failure. And knowing this dichotomy now allows us to target the cells that really are harmful. And uh, we, we're learning the, the supply mechanisms um, um, and the pathways that lead to oversupply of these cells. Mm -hmm. So Matthias, I know you're quite interested in the translational potential of, of, of these discoveries. What do you see as, see as the right patient populations? How do we identify them, select them, and what sort of clinical setting would you see marching this out in? So I think this is a really important point. I cut my finger this morning, and I, I'm glad the macrophages are at work. You, you can't really hit the, the, the system in a, in a non-differentiated uh, manner. You have to identify the right people and treat them uh, at the right amount. I think there are two key aspects. We can look at uh, circulating cells and in, in inflammatory biomarkers. So Paul Ricker is doing this in Cantos by, by treating people with high CRP. And then imaging will uh, play a large role where you can monitor inflammation in target organs, and we'll hear about this in a little bit. Great. Thanks, Matthias. So if we could go to number two, please. Number two, harnessing big data and deep learning for clinical decision support. With all the reams of electronic health data now available from patients, 
Most heart researchers and clinicians are struggling to keep up with this avalanche of information and derive its maximum value. This is where computational biology, which involves developing and using tools to analyze and model biological data and systems, and deep learning, which is the ability of computers to learn without being explicitly programmed, will revolutionize personalized medicine. Boston investigators recently launched a five-year study to examine the healthy heart's transition to serious disease. After gathering extensive health information from a cross-section of volunteers, it will be compiled in an electronic database where with the help of specially designed analytical programs, the researchers will be able to gather new insights into the progression of heart disease. Investigators spearheading another heart study in San Francisco expect to enroll up to 1 million participants worldwide. Then, using the latest technology, study volunteers will be able to relay information about their heart health in real time. By using advanced learning platforms to more efficiently sort through and analyze this health information, both research groups hope to create better ways to predict the occurrence and progression of heart disease, ultimately helping clinicians to improve the quality of care and deliver care more efficiently to their patients. Representing this idea is Christian Ruff, who's a cardiologist at Brigham and Women's, uh, also an investigator in the Timmy Group, has really been thinking and working quite deeply on how uh, AI can be used in clinical trials. Christian, we've heard a huge amount about data and big data and analytics. Uh, where do you see this first reaching practical realization in cardiovascular disease? Yeah, I think it's, it's a huge opportunity because it really transforms how we think about the care of cardiovascular patients in two ways. Probably the most fundamental is we'll begin to transition from treating disease to really managing health. And the important aspect of that is that it turns on its head basically how we've approached evidence-based medicine with interpretation and implementation of clinical trials where we've really established sort of average values of an association between a risk factor or a treatment effect, and we've tried to put it on top of an entire population in a very homogenous way, a one-size-fits-all approach. And what big data really allows us to do, both in the clinical trial setting, also within registries and real-world data, is to basically flip that on its head and to say it's actually the individual with millions of data points, whether it's omics, whether it's, it's imaging data, it's dense phenotyping with electronic medical records or registries to allow us to really analyze the heterogeneity, both with the effect of the disease and the associations, but probably more important, the different treatments, because certain heart failure patients or diabetes patients or patients for primary prevention are going to respond very differently with respect to the therapy. So I think that that's really the opportunity that big data allows us. So association is obviously a very uh, complex field. We, we noticed, for example, this uh, last two and a half days, there's an almost perfect correlation between SOC uh, liveliness and market capitalization. Um, what, amongst panel members, what, uh, what do you think are the challenges, the really, uh, the methodologic boundaries that are really going to hinder this as it moves into the clinic? So there are huge, there are two big, huge issues with big data approaches. One is data quality, and the second is validation. And the problem with data, de with data quality is enormous. Say you take an electronic medical record where you're going to use for big data approaches. Well, if there's not accuracy or veracity in that medical record, what you're going to churn out at the end of that correlation, because there's no causation in big data, will be completely meaningless. And so unless we take the efforts on the front end to make sure the data in the electronic health systems or in other uh, domains are accurate, none of what the downstream components will be important clinically. The second part is critical, and that's validation. What I worry about big data approaches is you'll have this end of one phenomenon. We have so much data in an individual patient, uh, it'll basically overwhelm the system. There'll be nothing that will sort of translate to other patients. And so the same approaches we use now in evidence-based medicine, where you have sharing of large data sets to do meta-analysis or other traditional uh, techniques to allow validation of anything that's found with a big data approach will give us more certainty that there, these correlations are truly associative, durable, and important. Christian, thank you. Let's go to number one.
Number 1. Quantitative Molecular Imaging for Cardiovascular Phenotypes Quantitative molecular imaging, the novel technology that emerged from discoveries made in the field of biology, allows non-invasive imaging of biochemical processes within the heart at the molecular and cellular level. The next decade will see quantitative molecular imaging regularly used to interrogate the very molecular events that drive so many heart disease processes. Using biomarkers, bioengineered with targeting and signaling components with low risk of toxicity, these sensitive and specific imaging probes will routinely be used to non-invasively pinpoint target molecules of interest within the heart when paired with positron emission tomography, magnetic resonance imaging, ultrasound, computed tomography, or optical imaging. Since quantitative molecular imaging offers the promise of early disease detection and prediction of treatment response, this may lead to optimal therapies for each patient. In the coming years, imaging probes will be used to uncover myocardial apoptosis, metabolic alterations, and injury to the extracellular matrix, providing clinicians with critical information for assessing the risk of arrhythmias and left ventricle remodeling associated with heart failure and progressive cardiac dysfunction. With molecular imaging, physicians can improve patient care by accurately identifying those at greater risk of lethal arrhythmias and sudden cardiac death, eliminating the need for invasive medical devices and unnecessary surgical techniques for those who will not benefit from a defibrillator. In the next decade, by understanding the different cellular phenotypes that result from interactions between genes and the environment, precise treatments for cardiac care will be formulated to offer each patient the best therapy and a better chance for a healthy and longer life. So this uh, technology is represented by Viviani Taketi, who is a cardiologist uh, whose research is in this area at the Brigham Women's Hospital. Uh, Viviani, obviously as cardiologists, we've had the benefit of phenomenal imaging technologies for many years, from images taken from within the heart to you know, CT, MRI, and so on. What is it that you think makes quantitative molecular imaging so powerful, and why do you think this is really going to transform cardiovascular medicine over the next decade? Thank you, Tony. And it's, of course, a bit humbling to represent the number one disruptor in the cardiovascular space. But uh, it's true that cardiovascular imaging, and in particular quantitative molecular imaging, holds tremendous potential to elucidate cardiovascular phenotypes. And we have seen again and again over the last three days how more accurate phenotyping of cardiovascular disease, whether in atherosclerotic disease, heart failure, atrial fibrillation, represents an absolutely key step in moving forward towards targeted therapeutics, particularly in an era of precision medicine. And so if we consider how clinical therapeutics device uh, uh, development has evolved, really dependent on clinical trials, uh, really mega trials now, 20, 30,000 patients who are followed for 10 years for a binary yes or no event, often already in a background of existing medical therapies, and with very heterogeneous mixed risk profiles, uh, and also adherence rates, as we witnessed recently in the HEFPEF trial space, we begin to appreciate, and it becomes very clear, that we need to improve efficiency as well as signal to noise. Quantitative molecular imaging allows us to fundamentally probe biology in a functional, dynamic way that is non-invasive, specific to the individual patient, and to really probe and stress the human biological system throughout every stage of the disease process, from subclinical to monitoring response to therapies. This will allow us to better understand how complex factors, genetic and environmental, can really uh, interact at the individual patient and at the target organ of interest to better understand how disease manifests throughout the life cycle. So in order to move forward to the next step of cardiovascular innovation, as I think in touches upon pretty much all of the disruptors already identified, 
we need to deeply invest in phenotyping cardiovascular disease and then leveraging that knowledge to understand who will or will not benefit from a particular therapy. In this role, quantitative molecular imaging may be transformative beyond what we have seen yet. Thanks, Viviani. So we heard about a number of targets. Any predictions what will be first into the clinic in terms of you know, routine part of either clinical trials or clinical practice? It's a good question, but I think more about this as a toolbox okay. of many, you heard about many different modalities. And I think what the key is, is tying the question, the hypothesis, the biological hypothesis to the appropriate patient population and asking the question. And then with that, we can tie the appropriate tools. So whether it's FDG imaging, more specifically for plaque and inflammation, um, whether it's looking at uh, tracers that focus on amyloid, whether it's actually just quantifying physiology um, using blood flow and tracers, um, we really need to connect and leverage not just imaging biomarkers and separately devices and serum biomarkers and genetics, but really think about how to utilize each of these tools to better answer appropriate questions for the patient populations that we're interested in helping. Great. Thanks, Viviani. Well, I, I'd certainly like to congratulate all of the 12 disruptors and thank them for sharing their exciting science with us this afternoon. Thank you so much. And so now uh, it's my great uh, pleasure to uh, welcome Anne Klebanski to the stage. Anne is the Chief Academic Officer of Partners Healthcare, uh, a physician scientist with a, a terrific track record in her own right, who's really been, you know, in many ways, the guiding force behind this series from the beginning. Anne, thanks so much. Thank you, uh, Tony, and thank you, Callum, uh, not only for the introduction, but all the fantastic work you've done in terms of the forum throughout these past three days. So two points about the current forum. First of all, and this is the message that I relayed from the beginning, and I want to close with this, is the unique opportunity of this forum is to bring together our academic community, industry, venture, government, all the different sectors to think about problems collectively. So it is that opportunity that I don't want to see go to waste. So I'm hoping that all of the dialogues and the discussions that have taken place will continue after the forum has closed. Second thing I want to highlight is I have heard from so many of you about how important that first look session was at the beginning of the forum. It was clearly a, a wonderful opportunity to highlight some of our really uh, talented and future-thinking scientists throughout the system. We're actually now talking about starting a specific program to help develop those scientists uh, to really help them cultivate the careers that they have, and most importantly, how to bring and foster those innovations uh, out into the community and ultimately to help patients. So in terms of next year, uh, looking forward, uh, it was number two on the hit list here, uh, but that's close enough. Let's say it was almost number one. Uh, was a theme that came out really throughout all of the sessions, and, and that was really the importance of data. Uh, the vast amounts of data that we collect as clinicians, as researchers, what do we do in terms of curating the data, uh, how do we integrate these very diverse data sets that are really coming from multiple, multiple sources, whether it's the electronic medical record or devices, uh, all things that capture information. So these are really the important things to think about. And again, as I said, it's been thematic throughout the forum, going well beyond cardiovascular, really into all the disease areas talk a lot about machine learning and algorithms, and then, of course, getting into deep learning and artificial intelligence. And I would say that these are issues that will really be very much ready for investments, not only from the academic community, but also from all companies uh, and venture thinking ahead in terms of health concerns. So on that note, I will thank everyone and welcome you to the next uh, 2018 Forum on Artificial Intelligence and Healthcare, which will really, I think, capture all of these ideas uh, in a single forum. So registration's open. We welcome you all to join us, and thank you for coming this year.
The idea that a machine could exhibit the same level of intelligence as a human being has captivated scientists for decades. That day is nearing. AI is not about building a robot, but developing a computer mind that can think like a human, that learns, that can even approach and exceed human levels of intelligence. AI has the potential to change the world of healthcare forever. The AI machine brain enables computers to do what humans do. See, hear, reason, analyze, and decide. At the World Medical Innovation Forum, our leading experts from around the globe will discuss the many issues this creative, disruptive force poses to technologists and society, offering real-life scenarios about how AI is going to significantly impact healthcare in the next five to ten years. How AI computing platforms will lead us from the unimaginable to the imaginable. How AI will help save lives and change the human condition for the better. It's an exciting time in healthcare. Come join us in 2018.